Cancer is a scourge that we have not yet figured out how to eliminate. It is a terminal disease that strikes fear in the hearts of patients. Chemotherapy and radiation are primary treatments, but they do not always discern between healthy cells and cancer cells. Surgery is used, but it can also cause serious harm. Compared to these options, targeted therapy brings greater hope to cancer patients. Targeted therapy attacks the weak points of cancer cells, inhibiting or destroying them. Like shooting a medicinal arrow at a bullseye, it kills cancer cells without harming normal cells. But how was such a huge step forward in cancer treatment possible? Sporting a beard, t-shirt, shorts, and sandals, it can be hard to imagine that in the laboratory, he is a serious renowned scientist. He is Tony Hunter, a professor of biology at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies. His contributions have been indispensable to the development of targeted therapy. I had just come back from England as an assistant professor here in 1975 and I began working on um, the polyoma tumor virus. It's a, um, a DNA virus that causes tumors in, in rodents like hamsters. My goal was to try and understand how this virus converts a normal cell into a cancer cell. Research from 40 years ago remains vivid in Hunter's mind. Today, it is common knowledge that tumors are growths resulting from uncontrolled division of abnormal cells. Typically, this condition is a result of damaged DNA or mutated genes. In the 1970s, however, these were not established facts in the medical community. In particular, it was not known how genes caused cancer. In 1979, the 36-year-old hunter, who is concentrating on finding viral causes of cancer in animals, changed the course of cancer research with a seminal discovery of tyrosine kinases. A tyrosine kinase is an enzyme that attaches a phosphoryl group to the amino acid tyrosine of a protein. Growth signals use this mechanism as a switch to control cell growth. When phosphorylation occurs, the cell is turned on and grows. When the phosphoryl group is removed, growth of the cell is turned off. If mutations occur on the tyrosine kinase, causing the switch to always be turned on, the cell will grow uncontrollably, which can lead to malignant tumors. It has been shown that the aberrant expression of tyrosine kinases is associated with many different human cancer types. I didn't actually know if it was new, but then I contacted a series of experts in the field. I called up several people and said, have you ever heard of a tyrosine kinase? And they said, no, we haven't. So as far as I could tell, it was new. Of course, then you couldn't, there was no internet, so you couldn't search. So you had to go to the, to the literature in the library and look, but I couldn't find anything. After making telephone calls and checking various resources, Hunter finally realized this was an all-new breakthrough. Though he did not yet understand the full impact this discovery would have over the next 40 years, Hunter had put cancer treatment on an entirely new path. Research that followed focused on abnormal tyrosine kinases. Researchers examined the signaling pathways cancer cells use to survive and searched for ways to block the active sites of tyrosine kinases. To this day, millions of patients have been treated by targeted therapy drugs. There are already at least 32 types of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in circulation. At the beginning, we thought it might be important. Then the evidence began to emerge that um, there's you know, a link to human cancer, but I wouldn't have predicted it would be so important in cancer at the time. The most astonishing part of this history is that Hunter's discovery was accidental. The 20 standard amino acids that serve as building blocks for proteins have different sizes and charges. Therefore, an electric circuit can be set up to hold a swimming competition to separate the molecules. This method is called electrophoresis. Fresh pH 1.9 buffer was recommended for the experiment, but little did one know pH changes over time. Once, when using an old buffer, Hunter noticed something nobody had ever seen before. When I came to separate the radioactive mixture of amino acids, I was too lazy to make up the, the buffer solution, the solution that we use to separate the amino acids. And it turned out that because I'd used an old buffer, 
that I got the phosphotyrosine to separate from the other two amino acids. And so that was the accident. When I'm talking to students, I say, you know, this could have been a, a big artifact, right? It could have been, you know, I smudged something. So in addition to um, repeating the experiment, which said it was probably right, one has to have an open mind that it could be something new and not something, you know, not that you made a mistake. From this moment forward, the awards began to roll in, including the 2005 Wolf Prize in Medicine from Israel and the 2017 Schoberg Prize from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Even with all his impressive records, Hunter remains highly active around the lab, going in seven days a week, not only for his own research, but also to give guidance to students and colleagues. Uh, he's learning some techniques. It's like he's cloning something there. Uh, colony PCRs. <laughs> colony PCRs, there you are, you see. This is Kevin, another postdoc. He's working on the histidine phosphorylation story I told you briefly about. He's from, he's French. French, yeah. Great lab, fantastic environment, and it's very enjoyable because we have a lot of diverse research within our laboratory. A lot of labs focus on single pathways or mechanisms, and in our lab, Chilling is a big fan of free thinking, so it's very exciting and interesting because a lot of projects are very diverse, so you're always learning about new topics. Oh, before. goodness. <laughs> I don't know, I think more than six years. Six years, yeah, she's yeah. been here six years. So, yeah, it can take a lot of years to get to something uh, useful um, to answering scientific questions that are relevant to disease and human problems. Talented young scientists with a wide range of research interests bring great energy to Hunter's laboratory at the Salk Institute. Some students use summer vacation to come here to learn, while others stay for years. Hunter's door is always open. They're very special. They're very, very approachable. They really want that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, his office door is always open. So I kind of grew up in this environment where, you know, if something came up, you know, you just go and ask and you get an answer and you know or you get a direction or even more than that you know you get hands-on um, assistance. Is it helpful? <laughs> oh absolutely. <laughs> Knows what page on what notebook to go to. I don't tell them what to do I think they need to figure out what to do themselves I mean I'll give them advice and feedback but I won't actually tell them what to do I don't sit down with people every day and say this is what you need to do they have to figure it out themselves. Stacks of papers and books fill Hunter's office. They are on tables, bookshelves, and even the floors. Dense handwriting fills the pages of the binders. These are detailed, carefully arranged records of the meetings that Hunter attends. Just like his scholarly work, Hunter is rigorous in his note-taking. Piles of uh, paper. And then on these shelves are all of my uh, notes from meetings. So starting in 1975, there I have notes taken at meetings um, and seminars over the past um, 43 years. And so take any one of these. It has um, a nice table of contents, and then um, wow, you mm, organize everything. see if I can find. There's a there's a meeting, for instance, I took notes on. Wow. Um, 2016. Writing. Yeah, that's all. I still write by hand. Well, as a memory uh, aid, so if I want to remember what was said by someone at a meeting, I go back to my notes and look. Mm -hmm. And. Um, if I've gone to a scientific meeting, I will put my notes out for other people to read, if they can read my handwriting. Tony's middle name is Rex, which led to the nickname T-Rex. T-Rex became his symbol. Statues and dolls are found throughout his office. Decorations over the doorway reflect Hunter's style, and a sketch created by a friend turned Hunter's trademark beard into a phylogenic tree of kinases. As a proud father, Hunter also displays a glevic molecular structure model created by his son in high school. That's a picture of me uh, dressed up as um, 
Queen Titania in um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Hunter was born in the United Kingdom in 1943. His father was a surgeon, though Hunter decided to focus on scientific research. After getting a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, he went to San Diego Salk Institute in what would prove to be a life-changing move. Besides his impressive academic achievements, Hunter married and had two sons. He fell in love with life on the U.S. West Coast. Each year, he would enjoy nature on skiing, hiking, and cycling trips. He especially likes rafting, which his family would partake in on annual trips to the Colorado River. Once when rafting in rapids with his two children, Hunter was knocked off the boat and into the water by a big wave, terrifying his wife, who watched the incident unfold from behind a camera. I'm looking through the movie camera, right, and I'm trying to see where he is, and I could not see that he was hanging on to the back of the boat. And what he actually managed to do was to climb back in, and meanwhile, our son was in the front of the boat. I think he took the oars, or he was, they, they were in charge anyway. I think that Tony is still in the water, and I think, gosh, am I filming the demise of Tony Hunter. I mean, I just didn't know. So I was, I was very, very nervous. If she can't see me, I'm clinging onto the boat, so. And there we are. I'm back in the boat here, so. Hunter speaks about the escapade with excitement in his eyes. To him, it was never a moment between life and death, but a tale of adventure worth being told. He sees rafting as the best way to relax, away from the hard mental work of science. I think it's helpful in the sense that you get, get away from everything, you know. If you're on a river, there is no internet access. It's a great way to relax, you, you really, even if you go with other scientists, which we do most of the time, on the rivers at least, uh, we don't talk much science. It's, uh, you know, many things in life, but not science. So. After going unshaven on a boating trip in 1972, Hunter decided to keep his beard and it became his trademark feature. Obviously didn't shave at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and by the time I came out uh, two weeks later, I had already a little you know, beard. And from that point I thought, well, why bother to shave? It's a nice beard and uh, it was the 1970s and so it was more, um, you know, hippie times with long hair. I, I had long hair and uh, still do, I guess. Hunter's wife is also British. They went hand in hand on countless wilderness journeys, as shown by the many souvenirs and family photographs that decorate their home. She and the rest of the family see Hunter as a limitless source of knowledge. He's like a walking encyclopedia. I mean, he does, the, there's almost any question, if he doesn't know the answer, he's going to know where to go and look it up. Certainly within our family growing up, the boys knew that dad would always be the one, the resource to tell them anything they wanted to know. Hunter's children are grown now. One followed in his father's footsteps by becoming a scientist. The pair even did research together. Already 75 years old, Hunter has devoted most of his life to science. He is familiar with every nook and cranny of the Institute where he works and teaches. After 25 years at the Institute, employees like Hunter are honored by having their name inscribed into a brick, reminiscent of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Renata Dolbeco, a Nobel Prize winner. And so all of these people have been, were here for 25 years or more. And I was a fairly early employee, so you can see um, my bricks here on the, uh, on the second step. The thing about the Institute is that uh, there's always different angles you see. You know, you're looking around and you see another angle because of the way that the concrete was poor. Hunter is a curious thinker who loves new things. He has a strong passion for research and plans to continue doing it in the future. I'll keep doing cancer research until I retire. Yeah, I turn 75 in oh, next month. So I hope to have a few more good years of, of doing uh, cancer research, yes. I'll retire if I can no longer raise money. 
to do the research. That's, no, that's the way it works, actually. Retirement may be on the horizon, but Hunter is not ready to call it a day yet. For today's interview, Hunter wore his favorite t-shirt, which depicts a history of phosphorylation research. He is proud that his discovery of tyrosine kinase is included on the timeline. It's the field. It starts in 1906 here, so obviously I wasn't around then, but one of them is my achievement. It will hopefully go on to another 100 years, right? Yes, I won't be around, but it will go on for another 100 years, yes. So. With a contribution of many scientists moving the research forward, miracles began to appear. The first of these miracles to save millions of lives is the cancer drug Gleevec. Oh, gosh, it means everything to me, because if it weren't for the Gleevec, I wouldn't be here talking to you. In three weeks, I'm getting married. Uh, yep, thank you. Yep. Soon to be married, this groom wears a smile of contentment. From the outside, he looks like the picture of health, though he suffers from chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML. Being from really, really sick, uh, you know, when I, before I took it, I mean, I was down to 117 pounds, and normally I weigh about 150 pounds, uh, but uh, I started to get more energy. Uh, prior to taking it, I was really tired all the time. A year later, I was doing things like it was normal, like I wasn't sick anymore, which is really amazing. He was on death's door until being given another chance at life. This miracle drug, which was named imatinib and sold under the trade name Gleevec, is the most successful targeted cancer therapy drug of the 21st century. Previously, patients diagnosed with CML had about two years to live. Gleevec dramatically raised that life expectancy by turning CML into a chronic disease rather than a death sentence. The person behind targeted cancer therapy's biggest success story is this man. We took cells, put them in a plate, and then added various drugs to see if we could kill the cell. 63-year-old Brian Drucker is the director of the Oregon Health and Science University Knight Cancer Institute. He was born in 1955 in Minnesota and completed his MD at the University of California, San Diego. Drucker is both a medical doctor and a scientist. After Tony Hunter discovered the tyrosine kinase pathway that many cancers rely on, Drucker used his knowledge to create a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that is now sold under the brand name Gleevec. This drug was the first of its kind opening up a whole new field. I started my career as a medical oncologist and I grew tired of giving chemotherapy and having it not work. Um, this was in the 1980s when I was in training and we were giving chemotherapy and most often we were oftentimes doing more harm than we were doing good. And I was getting incredibly frustrated by that. Druger believed there was a way to kill cancer cells without harming normal cells. At the time, however, there were doubts in the pharmaceutical community. Now the problem was at the time, not a lot of people thought that was possible. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to thinking about what's now called targeted therapy. Would that ever work? Um, the view was it was too simple or one, a single agent would never work for cancer. CML is a cancer that is characterized by a massive overproduction of white blood cells. CML patients have a shortened chromosome in their blood and bone marrow. This chromosome came to be known as the Philadelphia chromosome after the city where it was first described. It is the result of a piece of chromosome 9 and a piece of chromosome 22 breaking off and swapping places. This translocation results in an oncogenic bcr able gene fusion, which codes for tyrosine kinase that is uncontrollable and always on. It is like an engine that can't be turned off. It exhausts ATP, which is the fuel that powers our cells and transmits downstream signals to produce excessive amounts of white blood cells. I moved to Oregon, I had really one goal, and that goal was to identify a drug that would work against this particular type of leukemia I was working on and get it out of the lab and into the clinic. Drucker came to Portland where he met Nick Leiden, a pharmaceutical company scientist who shared Drucker's vision. Working with compounds that Leiden created, Drucker identified a small molecule that killed off CML cells. The molecule works by occupying the bcr able tyrosine kinase active site, which breaks down the engine, blocking out the fuel needed for downstream signaling. This would stop the cancerous signals, but their plan hit a roadblock. 
Leiden's company was merged into Novartis, which had doubts about the project. To make things worse, preliminary animal studies were not promising. Fortunately, Drucker would not let his project die. This is why I became a doctor. This is why I concentrated on cancer research. This is what I promised my patients. I was going to find a better way to treat cancer. And here it was. And so I invested my entire life and career in this medication. And if it didn't work, um, I was going to have to go back and find a whole new way of, of approaching this disease. For others, it was, well, it's going to be too complicated. It won't work. It'll never be safe. So there are all these skeptics. But for me, it was, this was the simple path forward. Every day, Drucker saw patients in urgent need of care. He continued to push Novartis for assistance until he finally persuaded the company to release some of the drug for human tests. In June 1998, the first clinical trial for Gleevec took place. Since a compound like this had never been tested on humans, he was especially cautious. Early on, it was like, for me, it was walking on eggshells because if this treatment only bought them an extra month, that wasn't good enough. And so I had to wait. Was it going to be a month? Was it going to be two months? Was it going to be six months? But the patients were way ahead of me. Within a few months, they were feeling great. Their health had returned. And they started telling me stories about how their hope for the future had been restored. And so I was just waiting and saying, well, I don't know how long this is going to last, but, it's, but Dr. Drucker, I feel so much better. And I'm starting to think about, I may go out and buy a new car. I may buy a house. I may take a trip I never thought I could take. And so they're starting to live their lives again instead of planning their deaths. And so that hope gave me hope that we actually were onto something that had never been seen in history of medicine. The results were astounding. In one clinical trial involving subjects who had shown resistance to other drugs, after just four weeks of taking Gleevec, 53 out of 54 patients regained normal white blood cell counts. In another trial, after five years, 98% of subjects maintained normal white blood cell counts. The survival rate was 89%, and only 17% of the patients had a relapse. The impressive results led the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to mark the drug for priority review. In May 2001, after just three months, Gleevec was available on the market. Saves lives, many lives. And you can't, you can't forget that in any of this. It, lives that normally would have been lost are living happily and healthily today. Proof that that's a strategy for treating cancer. And I believe he, you know, he gave birth to precision therapy. The idea that that one pill could, without very many side effects at all, fundamentally cure a, a leukemia it was no one would have bet on that uh, except us. <laughs> Gleevec was the first successful tyrosine kinase targeted therapy by a small molecule inhibitor. It raised the survival rate of patients with chronic myeloid leukemia from 50% to 90%. Patients who would have previously needed a bone marrow transplant could instead take a pill. Time magazine referred to Gleevec as bullets used in the war against cancer, even calling it a revolutionary pill that targets only diseased cells and does not harm normal cells. In 2002, Taiwan included Gleevec in the National Health Insurance Program. For cancer patients, given a new lease on life, it was a dream come true. In September 2005, Rob Schick was diagnosed with CML. Since he regularly exercised and had a healthy diet, he never imagined that he would get cancer. And they explained to me that a normal white blood count in humans, five, five to 10,000, and mine was 350,000 growing out of control. So over 30 times normal. And you know, it was just shocking to me and my family because I'd been healthy when I had three young kids at home. Uh, and having to tell them and my wife was just very, very difficult. Having nearly lost hope, Rob sought Drucker. The first question Drucker asked has stuck with Rob to this day. He 
asked me before we talked about anything, his first question was, tell me what life was like before your diagnosis and what life is like now. And I thought that was very unique and uh, thoughtful. Um, not clinical, but personal. And, and, and it's important to be personal and connected to your patients. Within five weeks of starting to use Gleevec, Rob's white blood cell count returned to normal. He did not need chemotherapy. Already 57 years old, for the past 13 years, Rob has taken Gleevec every day. He participates in cancer charitable activities and gives fundraising speeches as a way of helping others with cancer. Early on, um, in the darkest of places, um, I thought if I, if I can get through this, I can't say yes enough. I can't get, I, I, I just, I can't give back. How do you give back for having your life saved? How, what, what's, what's the point where you say, okay, that's enough, we're even. And, and, and that, that just can't, in, in my case, that will never come as long as I'm drawing breath. Uh, I will be here, I will be involved. Gleevec has saved one person after another from death. A group of patients wrote down their memories and put them into thick binders, which they gave to Drucker. Whenever Drucker flips through these pages, he thinks about the pain of disease and the joy of healing. His patients' experiences have become emotional stories of rebirth. They started by thanking my mother. <laughs> one child, who was six years old, began treatment within a month after the FDA approval of Gleevec in 2001. She's now a nurse at our hospital. I still see many of these patients uh, now 18, 19, 20 years later. And that, to me, that's the, the greatest reward of all. Like his patients, Drucker's life took a turn for the better. He was a workaholic as a young scientist until he finally encountered his soulmate. When they met, she was a journalist for People magazine who was sent to report on the medicine Gleevec and the scientist who developed it. I didn't think that the medication or the, the Gleevec would go anywhere, but I was struck by how respectful he was to his patients. That impressed me. Um, because in general, uh, I'm not very fond of doctors. I always think of doctors as being very, uh, very arrogant. And he was very respectful, very humble, and seemed to really care de deeply for his patients. So I was more impressed with that than the possibility of the scientific breakthrough. When I was younger, I was very focused on work. She asked me once, uh, what do I do in my spare time? And I looked at her and I said, well, I work, I work out, I eat, and I sleep. Well, that was my life in those days when I was working on the development of Gleevec. And she looked back at me and said, you're pathetic. So <laughs> uh, she was right. I didn't have much work-life balance. One was a talented young doctor, the other a capable journalist. They dated, married, and eventually had three children. Drucker's life became more than just work. We play a lot of games together, we watch movies. We really love playing and spending time together as a family. He's always really kind and even if he's tired, he still helps and makes sure that everyone's happy. This is Sebastian. It's, he's a five. Oh, look yes, good boy. It has been just the most wonderful thing I'm, to have a family to balance and, and I never thought that I'd have children and I really really enjoy my kids and, and I've enjoyed them at every stage. When he's not working he plays games and basketball with his children enjoying the pleasures of being a father. A family consisting of one cat, one dog and five people, Drucker is satisfied with his life. He loves to run and thought about joining marathons in his youth. He still runs to work each day. It's just a good way to relax for me. Um, and it helps promote health also. Drucker runs on roads and trails, conquering hills and rain. When he feels down, he runs farther and harder to release his frustration. He is a strong advocate of exercise and eating fresh fruits, but he knows this does not guarantee a cancer-free life. No matter how hard somebody tries, that some people get cancer no matter how healthy they are. And so I think it always makes sense to 
be healthy, eat healthy, exercise, try to maintain a, a reasonable weight. But even at the, in the best of circumstances, some people will still get cancer because we know it, it's often a genetic predisposition. It may be something in the environment. It may also just be, as we get older, our, our bodies wear out, and that's just unfortunately what happens. So I, I'd never try to blame somebody that if they didn't live you know, a healthy life, that that's why they got cancer. Drucker's decision to study oncology is closely related to his family's struggles with cancer. My father died of a different, a different type of leukemia. Um, after I developed Gleevec, my brother died of prostate cancer. And for me, cancer is personal. And then when you talk to my wife, she lost her mother when she was only five years old. So for my family, it's very personal. Cancer runs in our family, and we've had a lot of relatives that have passed away from cancer. It's really great to see my dad do because it real, like we know that cancer can affect a lot of people. And numerous awards are displayed in Drucker's office, including the Lasker to Bakey Clinical Medical Research Award and the Japan Prize. When receiving the latter prize, Drucker had the honor of sharing a meal with the Emperor and Empress of Japan. For the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, he carried the Olympic torch. Drucker is confident about future cancer treatments, as shown by the to-do list in his office, which lists cure cancer as the first task. Drucker used small molecules to inhibit tyrosine kinase active sites, blocking the signals that lead to cancerous growths. In a much earlier setting, John Mendelssohn raised the possibility of a different strategy to target cancer. Mendelssohn is an internationally recognized leader in cancer research. From 1996 to 2011, he was president of the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, one of the world's leading cancer treatment and research centers. He has had an immense influence on the institution, as shown by the displays describing his work and accomplishments. He was a great role model in many ways for me. And as I observed him as president, I learned a tremendous amount about what the characteristics and qualities of an MD Anderson president should be. I really admired him and I look up to him and I learned a lot. I mean, I was able to learn from his experiences. Not only is Mendelssohn a visionary leader, but also a pathbreaking researcher. After Tony Hunter's discovery that tyrosine kinases are involved in cancer, one specific tyrosine kinase caught Mendelssohn's attention, the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR. Overexpression or mutation of EGFR is a cause of many cancers, including breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, and bladder cancer. While at the University of California, San Diego, Mendelssohn, together with Gordon Sado, hypothesized that antibodies could block the signaling pathways activated by the transmembrane protein EGFR. By inhibiting activation of this receptor tyrosine kinase, the antibodies could be an effective strategy for preventing cancer growth. In a sense, the antibodies would be like gum blocking the ignition to a car. Mendelssohn and Sado wanted to develop monoclonal antibodies that could inhibit the tyrosine kinase, but their idea was met with much skepticism. Most people doubted that monoclonal antibodies could be turned into effective drugs, and nobody was willing to give them sufficient funding for their research. The concept was proposed in the early 1980s. And at that time, frankly speaking, most of people don't believe it. Okay, and a lot of novel discovery is like this way, because the reason people thought that it's difficult to believe it, because this type of receptor it's critical for normal cell. So one could say, well, you develop a monoclonal body target the easier receptor to uh, kill the cancer cell, but you may at the same time suppress your normal cell growth. Relying on charitable funding, they developed a C225 monoclonal antibody. After overcoming numerous setbacks, the US FDA approved it for treatment of colorectal cancer as well as head and neck cancers. The drug is known as cetuximab and is distributed under the trade name Arbutux.
It was the first targeted therapy that used an antibody to inhibit tyrosine kinase activity. Colorectal patients who took Herbitox, in addition to undergoing chemotherapy, increased their three-year survival rate from 18% to 41%. This success made it a standard-use drug. More than two decades have passed between Mendelssohn's proposal to develop the drug and FDA approval. Let me just use the head and neck as an example. This type of cancer, there are more than 60% of them EGM receptors overexpression, i.e. this type of EGM receptor overexpression cancer patient potentially could be benefited by this type of drug because their EGM receptor overexpression. Actually already affected in the last uh, almost 20 years now, it's affected, let me see, 100,000 or maybe even million uh, 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 patient population. Our news team interviewed the 82-year-old Mendelssohn in his home in Houston. He is currently battling glioblastoma, a type of brain cancer, and rarely appears in public anymore and agrees to very few interviews. But today, he made an exception, facing down his illness to speak openly about his life and career, including the development of Herbitox. We made an important contribution because we are able to show that uh, very focused and uh, working, linking together people uh, produced wonderful results, but it was part of a huge team effort. As for the future of cancer treatment, Mendelssohn acknowledges that even with an ongoing series of breakthroughs, there's a long road to travel before we truly beat cancer. There's no perfect treatment, and I think that the uh, new treatments that are being developed uh, are getting us closer to understanding why an area becomes important. Born in 1936 in Cincinnati, Ohio, Mendelssohn started out majoring in biochemistry at Harvard University. At one point, he worked in James Watson's laboratory. Watson had just accepted a position at Harvard after having co-discovered the structure of DNA. He would go on to win a Nobel Prize in medicine. Mendelssohn was the first undergraduate college student to work in Watson's laboratory. Part of my sophomore year uh, was sort of boring, like the freshman year. And then um, sometime during the middle of the year, uh, a 28-year-old, very young and extremely uh, clever, man took over and for some reason he and I got along and I was his first student and uh, we, we did a lot of building together. Deciding to be a doctor, he later studied medicine and graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1963. In 1970, he went to the University of California, San Diego, where he founded a cancer center and served as director. In 1985, Mendelssohn moved to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he chaired the Department of Medicine for 11 years. At the time, it was ranked as the top cancer center in the United States. In New York, I felt like he was, he was quite accomplished, but I didn't necessarily see what he was doing to the community every day. And then in the New York Times, I think Crystal Myers ran an ad, almost a full-page ad saying, you know, you wouldn't give uh, Newton, you know, money and tell him what to do with it and, you know, came with a couple different scientists, famous historical scientists, and then on the other side of the page it said, that's why we gave John Mendelssohn, I think it was $250,000 grants and didn't tell him what to do with it. And that came out when I was just after college and I was like, wow, what is this? It was really amazing. From 1996 onwards, Mendelssohn was the president of MD Anderson, serving a total of 15 years. He showed a great knack for leadership, offering personal guidance to students while raising funds for new plans and research. By combining teamwork and cross-departmental treatment with precise decision-making and passion, Mendelssohn turned MD Anderson into the top cancer treatment and research center in the United States. He greatly expanded everything from staff to equipment. During his tenure as leader, we had a significant capital campaign. We grew tremendously as an organization. We went from about 8,000 employees to 20,000. And that was a big change for us here at MD Anderson. That came along with a, a brand new hospital, new ambulatory clinics. Very early on, he was able to 
see the importance of going from our outstanding clinical center that MD Anderson was to recruiting uh, outstanding scientists with a major emphasis of translational research. Not just a leader, but a cheerleader. I think he really used his style of leadership as not top-down, telling people what to do, but collaborative, working with your, uh, your employees and trying to create institutions that are solving world problems and helping patients and doing so in a way that's really collaborative and brings out the best in, in people. Mendelssohn already had a close connection to Taiwan, having been awarded an honorary doctorate from China Medical University Hospital in Taichung in 2006 in recognition of his outstanding contributions to cancer treatment. Mendelssohn was the first honorary doctorate in the 48 years since the school's founding. It was a great symbol for a medical university and teaching hospital that were committed to becoming more international. After stepping down from the MD Anderson presidency, Mendelssohn became co-director of the Center's Institute for Personalized Cancer Therapy. The institute considers a patient's molecular profile and other characteristics when designing customized therapeutic methods, a popular new trend in cancer therapy. No matter how busy, Mendelssohn always reserved time for his family. Mendelssohn's son finally recalls how his father would return home every day for dinner. Made family a priority also. He would be home for dinner every night. So uh, I remember you know, my mother would be cooking a meal and the three kids would be setting the table and this and that and all of a sudden it would be close to dinner time. And if he wasn't there, I would hop on the phone in the breakfast room and say, Dad, come home for dinner when he's at the office. So uh, he, it really was a family tradition to have all five of us sitting around the dinner table. For the past 50 years, Mendelssohn's family has gathered every August for a lakeside camping trip in Pennsylvania. His children say their father never pressured them to study. Rather, he let them choose their own paths. Mendelssohn himself has a wide range of interests that includes art, traveling, and tennis. He rarely interferes in his children's lives, though one time he played the role of a matchmaker. On a trip abroad, he met a friend's daughter. Feeling that she was highly compatible with one of his sons, he suggested they meet. My father and my wife have this love of this certain Belgian chocolate that they discovered. They both have this love of this Belgian chocolate. My dad just really felt she was very special. He uh, thought, hey, she's in Washington, D.C., and Eric is in New York, and I think you guys would get along well. I had lunch with Isabel, and it was incredible, and I really felt like this is the woman I wanted to marry. Uh, so I think it was the one time in my life that my father had said, why don't you call this girl? Whereas in the past, it always been my mother. Mendelssohn's wife, Anne, is also well known in the medical community, having been an active participant in fundraising events and other activities at MD Anderson. In each of the three times that Mendelssohn made a significant career change, his wife was by his side, acting as an advisor and a supporter. Mendelssohn went from San Diego to New York, then Houston. They were stunning moves, but Mendelssohn made the most of each new position. For youths and young adults planning their futures, Mendelssohn offered the following advice. Well, you don't always uh, pick a winner. And the ones you hear about are the ones that were winners. But I would say that um, it's a fair statement that we've been pretty lucky in picking good choosers. So uh, a number of times when we've built in uh, a new uh, way of explaining something, it's tried out and it works. And um, it doesn't happen that often, so we were lucky that it happened a few times. After 22 years spent at MD Anderson, on August 31, 2018, the day of his 82nd birthday, Mendelssohn announced his retirement, completing the final chapter of a long and successful career in cancer research and treatment. On his retirement, he became president emeritus of MD Anderson. Shortly after his retirement, Mendelssohn's son Jeff accepted the Tong Prize on his father's behalf. Professor Hongzhou, please present the Tang Prize Medal to Mr. Jeff Mendelssohn, who will accept the prize on behalf of Dr. John Mendelssohn. He lived his life according to these two principles. 
Live each day so as to look forward with the greatest hope and the least regret. And finally, the last two words in the book, Howard's End, only connect. Thank you. Most of Mendelssohn's life was spent on helping countless others to fight cancer. Now it has become his own battle. Few can say that they have lived their life to the fullest with no regrets, but for all that he has done, Mendelssohn can definitely be one of them. Starting from Tony Hunter, the importance of tyrosine kinases in cancer growth was elucidated. Brian Drucker and John Mendelssohn set different examples on how we can use this knowledge to develop powerful cancer drugs. The contributions made by these three scientists helped usher in a new age in the battle against cancer. Hundreds of target therapies for many cancers have now been found and are the basis for the next generation of precision medicine. Custom-made therapies designed for particular patients and their unique set of circumstances are combined with new technologies and new treatment methods, such as genetic testing and immunotherapy. The path ahead is long and fraught with challenges, but thanks to the three laureates of the 2018 Tong Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science, the foundation for success is firmly in place.